For those of you that made it from Merrill, it's good to see you and thanks for coming out and being engaged um, to make a well-educated decision. My name is Dave Hensley. Um, I'm married. My wife, Benji, is sitting in the front row. Benji and I have been married nearly 29 years now. Um, we met in college and we've raised three daughters who are all adults um, now and they're just amazing, beautiful women and we're super proud of them. My wife and I own 5-H cattle company right out here on Hope Road, just a few miles away and we love our rural way of life and we find a, a great amount of joy in developing our brand as a symbol of trust and respect in Merrill and in Klamath County. Um, I was a dedicated and committed public servant for 28 years. I served as a police officer. I worked my way up through the ranks and I retired last year as the Chief of Police for the City of Klamath Falls. As the Chief of Police, I was responsible for developing vision, setting priorities, leading a staff of nearly 50 people, and I was responsible for motivating and empowering staff to be successful. I also developed and managed multi-million dollar budgets for six years while I was the Police Chief there. While serving as the police chief, I was the district representative of the Oregon Association of Chiefs of Police. I was the co-chair of the Law Enforcement Executive Leadership Institute, and I was and still am on the board of directors for the Oregon Accreditation Alliance, which accredits law enforcement agencies in the state of Oregon and Alaska. I'm a graduate of Oregon State University, so I got to put a shout out, go Beavs. Um, I bleed black and orange, we love Oregon State. I'm a graduate of the prestigious FBI National Academy in Quantico, Virginia, where I attended for three months. Um, I'm a graduate of the Oregon Executive Development Institute, and I received my mid-management certi certi certification in policing from the Mark Hatfield School of Government at Portland State University. I just want to end real quick, because I'm probably right at my three minutes. Why am I running for commissioner? I don't need another job. I don't need a second career. I don't need income. <laughs> But I've been a dedicated and committed public servant for you for a long time. And I'm looking for a way to fill that void and continue to serve you. Um, so this, this job is all about people. I, I, uh, my three core principles are value people, find strength in your differences, and be accountable to others. And I feel like now that I'm retired, I'm kind of missing a piece of that in my life. So I'm running for commissioner to see if we can put the voice of people back into government. So thank you again for attending and God bless. Thank you, Mr. Hensley. Uh, Mr. Henley. Yes, uh, thank you very much for having me here, or us. Um, grew up in Southern California, moved here 12 years ago. Uh, graduated down there, uh, 85, graduated from the Sheriff's Academy. Uh, gave 13 years of volunteer service to them. Came up here, I retired, and after being up here for the time period I have been, it was very disappointing to see that the city or county has not been growing at the rate that it probably should be and almost stagnating in what I would call um, no growth. So after 12 years of retirement, I came out and I'm making a run for the commissioner spot to try to make things better for the people of Plymouth County. Thank you very much. No so I'm Brandon Fowler. I'm, for the last 20-some years, let's see, 25 years, I've been married to uh, my lovely wife, Anna. Uh, we've raised three wonderful children, uh, the last of which will be a senior in high school next year here at Klein Falls. Uh, we've owned a branch out east of Chilliquin for the last 20 years that we work on and enjoy very much. And most of that time, I've spent my professional career um, in project management, construction uh, for cell phone companies, AT&T, Verizon, uh, Sprint, a number of others, and then I've worked for uh, a number of smaller project management firms where I've been a leader and an executive for most of the last 20 some years. Um, one of the reasons I've sought this office is for the, it, it's the uh, next step in a long history of service to the Klamath County, uh, Klamath community. Uh, as, as I've worked, uh, served for a number of years with Children Fire and Rescue on their board of directors, their budget committee, um, I've been their IT director, I've done a number of things with them for a number of years. I've uh, served four years on Climate County's budget committee. I understand some of the challenges that we face from a budget standpoint. Um, my professional career, I've been, I've developed budgets, I've led teams, um, 
so it's, it's set management and leadership is second nature. You may have done it my entire professional career. With that, thank you much. Thank you, Mr. Crowler. My name is Todd Gessley, and it's good to be here tonight. Um, my wife, Gianni, is in the front row here. My son, Christian, is a freshman at KU. He's running the camera back there. Um, I own Totally Inspired Media, and we often work together and produce television shows or commercials or do weddings or you know, photography, that kind of thing. Um, my last international assignment was uh, pre-pandemic was in Kiev, Ukraine, and um, it was good to be there and see what, what was there before it got destroyed. Um, but um, So our, our media company does a lot of stuff about uh, helping citizens get voice and, and, and fight government corruption and, and try to get swift justice. Um, and so that's one of the things we've enjoyed doing as a, as a family, is, is, is working together. Um, one of the reasons I decided to, to run is, uh, being, being new here to the Basin, is that um, I've been an Oregonian 42 years, uh, I'm 52, so I grew up in Kansas, so I'm a Midwest boy. Um, my dad's a pastor, and um, so I like people. We've done a lot of visiting and going place to place. My background is um, 21 years of nonprofit um, work, basically promoting uh, healthcare, faith-based things, uh, and NGOs and healthcare and access for healthcare. I've worked in 42 countries around the world for clients, and um, uh, it, we just want to invest locally. And so we're, we, we moved here, and uh, no one told us about midges. Um, we're out by the lake, so we, we have that plague, and, and we're looking forward to representing you. I'm not tied to the old money in the basin. Um, it's just a fresh start. I'm looking forward to representing you from a neutral position. Thank you, Mr. Kessler. How would you apply the county home rule provisions in the face of an unwanted state or federal mandate? Well, if you're home rule, I definitely wouldn't want to say it. Um, that's a pretty wide subject, but uh, uh, Agenda 21, uh, which kind of fringes on that, but home rule, I would take that upon myself as being independent. Thank you. I don't feel like we apply them effectively at all currently. And so we need to we need to go back to looking at how can we maintain local control within our communities. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Crowder. Mr. Kessler. I one of the, my concerns is especially dealing with solar, um, because if it's over thirteen hundred acres, the the Oregon, um, Oregon State comes in and, 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 and deals with that. It's above and beyond the county. I don't know how we got to that arrangement or that, that thing, but I would like to see what we, we should, what happens in our county needs to stay uh, with our local home rule because there's, there's places that they're trying to put in more solar and, and, and that's something that the neighbors don't want. So um, that, that's something, one area I want to look at. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hensley. So for 28 years I carried a badge and a gun and I swore before God and country that I would uphold your constitutional rights and I think that's extremely important to me. Some of the things that I get frustrated about is I see some mandates from our governor that I don't believe to be constitutional. So first and foremost I think we need to examine is she or whoever the governor is, are they overreaching in some of these mandates that violates the U.S. Constitution and if so we need to stand our ground and say this is unacceptable and stand up for the Constitution and the constitutional rights of the people in Klamath County. So I think there's a time and place where, where you say enough is enough, we're not going to we're not gonna follow the silly order that violates the U.S. Constitution. So I think first and, foremost, first and foremost it takes an examination of those orders that come out of Salem. The second thing that I'll say about that is we need to make sure that we're not um, taking money from Salem that has strings attached to it that, that ties our hands to, to uphold that mandate. So I would like to consider if we're getting federal funding or if we're getting state funding, what does that do and what does that impact on our people and our constituents? And if we, if we get a mandate from Salem that says if you don't comply you're going to lose millions of dollars, I'm making this up, I don't know, we need to really examine to see what's the harm in, in us not complying with that mandate. So I would, I would be careful that we didn't further harm our community in such a way that, that we took a stand that really impacted our economy or, or impacted our people in a negative way. So there's a balancing act that would have to come along with any type of these mandates if we're going to take a stand against them. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kinsley. 
So next question I'll start with Mr. Fowler about the same direction. Uh, we mentioned the solar sites, and this, this happens to be the place Oregon has all kinds of generous grants, and this is where the sun shines, so this is where we get all the solar sites. And what are your thoughts on balancing, uh, keeping rural Oregon looking like farms versus uh, the property right owners of property rights to be able to put on a solar site? So you hit the nail on the head, it's a balancing act, right? Mm -hmm. it's, you know, you have, you have to balance the rights of a property owner um, to want to do whatever lawful, you know, purpose he has in mind for his property with, you know, what is, what is the needs of, of the community and things like that. So I, I think if you go back and I, I tend to come down on the side of the property owner and, and the rights of the property owner to an extent, um, but at the same time, I, I'm a firm believer we can't lose sight of the fact that Klamath County is an agricultural community. Um, that's our heritage, that's what, that's what we've done for generations, and we need to maintain that. And I think that's the balancing act we've got to figure out, and we've got to work towards. Just a quick follow-up question but for everybody, but would you support stricter regulations on solar sites going on farmland? I would have to look, I would have to look at it and see, see how it makes sense. Obviously, the devil's in the details, right? Because you, you get down to, you know, what's the, word, what's the words on paper? And, and how much are we tie in the hands of, of people and tell them what they can and can't do with their property. Um, at the end of the day, though, farmland should be for farms, and, and we need to grow more food. Uh, Mr. Gessel. County Planning Commission has spent three years working on this topic to figure out how to go forward, and uh, last, was it Wednesday or Thursday night, um, they, they basically, I, I was happy they kept the control and saying we want to keep control of our under 1,300 acres but if you are going, if you're a property owner and you want to do this, you need to get sign off from Fish and Wildlife, not sign off, but you need to have a plan, approval of a plan, um, and also with um, also the irrigation district. Because if you're going to take that land out of, out of irrigation, you lose your right. Well, you, the rights are still tied to the land, but there's more water for other people. So um, they wanted to have at least those two groups weighing in before they would even the county would look at citing the plan and, and changing zoning to do that so um, i think that's a step in the right direction um but again i think we need to go after and find out why we can't control anything above 1300. right there's a lot of dynamics that come into play when you talk about a solar project but let's take a step back even further we're, we're not getting water right now so i understand why a lot of farmers are saying hey if i'm not going to if I'm not going to farm this land, how else am I going to support my family? How else am I going to pay for college? How else am I going to pay for groceries and fuel? So I completely understand. My wife and I have 50 irrigatable acres that hasn't got water in two years. And I'm looking at the, few, the, few, the food shortage around the world and I'm thinking, hey, I got 50 acres, we can help out a little bit, but we can't. So I understand why some farmers are looking at different ways to have some money into their pockets. but. I also recognize that agriculture puts millions of dollars of revenue into this community, and we can't lose sight of that. Brandon used the word heritage, and he's exactly right. We are an ag community, and that's our roots. That's what our families have done. That's what brought us up, and, and I have a lot of pride in that. So um, it is a balancing act. I also understand the millions of dollars that the county gets in franchise fees from these projects. And that money is used to benefit Klamath County as well. So when people want to do a project, you ask the follow-up, would I be interested in stricter regulations? Absolutely. We need to make sure that we hit the pause button. We look at how much EFU land is going to be depleted off of our inventory of EFU land. But we also need to look at um, what, what's the income or what's the benefit going to be to the person that owns that land? Because it's their land, so God bless them, they have a right to their land. Um, but what else is it going to do financially for the county and, and make sure that, that it's a benefit to the greater good. So I would definitely be interested in some stricter regulations, hit the pause button, make sure we're doing something for the greater good of Klamath County. Hey Bill, can I pause yes, on that? Yes, Mr. Matthews. <clears throat> you saw the solar plant we had out here. I don't remember how many acres it was. There was like four feet inside the it's city. 10 megawatts is probably 20 acres. 20, 20 acres and the rest was out in the county. And I, I agree with you about the landowner, but the landowner lives in Southern California somewhere down there. 
and it was beautiful alfalfa land out there, and it was uh, strongly opposed by every, most everybody in town. To our dismay, the city council voted the way I didn't want them to vote. Uh, so, and then we get nothing out of it. We, you know, they, you say, where's the power? Well, it's going into the grid. We're not getting anything. They gave us a, a, a pittance uh, for, that we get a little interest off of, that we, you know, put toward festivals and stuff like that. Then it went from one owner to the next owner, to the next owner, to the next owner. Not a one of them kept their damn word. And it's a blight on our community, in my opinion. Right out there. They could have put it right out here. We own a property out here in the, uh, where the, the transfer station is. But they didn't want to put it out there. And that's what just burns me up, is that somebody from California owns the property, and that's why, and, and on that other uh, 50 or 60 acres or whatever the hell it was, the county commissioner went right along with it. Uh, you know, fine with them. Hell, it didn't bother them a bit, but it, it just bothers the heck out of me. Yeah, we're trying to get money out of this. It's now it's changed again. It's now New York City. So that's just... I remember the landscape. Uh, yeah, yeah, they, they, they did nothing that they said they were going to do. Yeah, we are fighting to protect water rights, which they will not help us with. Mm -hmm. You know, I came from an area that was farmland from the Antelope Valley. Solar came, and it did come in a big way. All you can see from miles and miles and miles of almost 40 to 45 minutes of driving down the highway, it's all solid solar for as far as the eye can see. And when I saw this coming, this is another reason I became involved and came out of retirement, because I don't want to see what happened in the valley I came from happen to this farmland. And once it's covered with a solar panel, you'll most likely never farm that ever again the rest of your life or your grandchildren. So does it concern me? Absolutely. And it concerns the rest of the farmers also. Um, as far as oversight, it's coming. The money that's being pushed behind this solar is the most incredible amount of money that you could possibly ever imagine. And there's no stopping it. But you can have oversight enough to be able to divert it and make it work together, along with farming, to a certain degree. Uh, but to keep it out, we all have to join together. Because divided, they will conquer. Uh, farmland is something that's so precious. Uh, there's a, I talked to Dave uh, Fogel before I came. And, he said, uh, the Planning Commission has been working with them better since January when I attended the first meeting and gave them some ideas about how to work with them. And they said the communication's been better, but not exactly as they would like to see. Um, he said, what they came up with the last meeting is much more acceptable than the first one. So they are slowly working their way down to a mutual agreement, we hope. Um, because if not, the solar will keep coming in. Um, and once the sites are in, oversight on the sites. Who's going to oversee them to make sure that they abide by the rules and regulations? Um, I worry about the pesticides that could possibly be used to spray underneath the panels to keep the weeds down. Who's going to check to find out what the toxicity levels of the soil is? is Who's going to take water samples to see if it is contributing to the pollution of the underground water? All these things need to be addressed down at the Planning Commission's office. So I asked the, um, the uh, Planning Commission individual, Noble, if I could get a copy of what they are talking about settling on. And he said, yes, yeah, just email me. So I'm expecting a copy of that any day to see exactly what it contains because after Examining um, Pete and Melinda's solar contract from quite a few years ago out by Derry, it lacked quite a few things because who's going to clean the solar panels up? So they adopted a bond situation, which uh, I suggested to one of the commissioners. How much that bond covers, I couldn't tell you. I don't know the details, and that's one thing that I would like to see. So uh, I would definitely have oversight. Am I against solar? It serves a purpose, yes. If you were to replace all the power here on this, uh, in the continental United States, you'd probably be, I think the stats are, 
a doctor didn't inform me, and he said it, you'd have to cover the United States three times over to replace the power that we use today. Is it feasible? No. Can we help it to offset um, our power grid? Yes, we can. So working together with it and utilizing the money that's coming in and hopefully utilizing the employment opportunities to be able to put our own people to work would be a great help because where I came from, prevailing wage and to find out whether or not they're using government money so they are pay paying prevailing wage of $70 an hour and $42 an hour, which would change the face of our communities, which it did there. It cut our unemployment down to pretty much under 2%. And families were able to live. <coughs> well, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, my question to the group is, what's the large, largest organization you managed and a typical budget associated with that large organization? Okay. Um, well, being a nonprofit, a lot of times our budgets are small, and it's what you can do with having very little. And you know, so it's kind of an opposite type of a thing. Um, I I own two companies. One is Totally Inspired Media. The other is Inspired Project Funding. And the largest project that I've worked on is about six hundred and seventy thirty-seven million dollars. Um, you know, working with a portfolio of condos in, in Miami to get it, get that funded with with investors. So I do have worked on some large numbers and performers and and budgets, uh, but it's been more in the in the funding uh, mortgage side of things than it has been uh, as a department. So when I worked at the Corvallis Police Department, that was the biggest police department I worked. I worked at, but I was a captain at the time, and I was responsible for a division of that agency. So I would say the largest agency that I've directly supervised is the Klamath Falls Police Department. And with all of the sworn and non-sworn staff, and the volunteers, and the cadets, and, and the explorers, I would say we were between 50 and 60 individuals that I was directly responsible for the day-to-day -day leadership and uh, motivation and inspiration of, of those, those staff members. Our budget was... Um, I think it was 6.8 million, if I remember correctly, about the time I retired. It was touching 7 million when I retired. Um, but more importantly, that budget, I was responsible for writing that budget line by line, item by item. It wasn't, they just handed uh, $7 million to me and said, do with what you want. Um, so we got down into buying paper and things like that, and then I had to present that budget annually to the city manager. And that budget was then presented to the budget co committee, and then it was sent before city council. So there was lots of checks and balances and lots of questions asked of me about that budget. The thing that I also want to add, the first two years that I was the chief in, in uh, Klamath Falls, I held that budget flat. Didn't raise that budget at all. And we were still very successful. We uh, put in a vehicle replacement schedule and, and weapons replacement schedule and a bunch of things like that to update and modernize that agency while holding it flat. So I was really proud of that. Uh, working at Universal Studios for approximately 11 years, uh, worked with the director uh, with a multi-million dollar budget. Uh, Universal Studios is a city itself. Didn't realize that when I went to work there. But it's uh, pretty overwhelming. Uh, I didn't realize it was, there was that much to it. But um, balancing the sewer systems, the water systems, uh, the park attendants. Um, it, I did not realize there was so much to running a city. It's absolutely amazing. Um, also, after in 05, I got my general contractor's license. Um, before the recession hit, that probably hit all of us somewhat in the pocket in 08, um, I was on my way to a very successful career as a contractor. And, uh, I grossed about a million dollars at it. I do believe it was 2007. The recession hit, and then it was um, save yourself. <laughs> I think we all know where that went. But uh, continue to hang on, and as my friends folded, uh, being able to balance my books properly, I was one of the few that survived. Didn't owe anybody anything. Paid my labor costs, my material costs, and came out ahead of everything. So I spent 16 years at at and In the last five years of that, I was in charge of uh, construction engineering for Oregon, Washington, Northern Idaho. 
uh, managed a staff of uh, over 125 people with an annual budget that I developed and managed um, in excess of $100 million a year. Yeah, I'll ask one more question and we'll turn it over to the audience. And so Mr. Hensley, I, I don't, I'm not an irrigation expert. I know it's very complex and probably oversimplifying this to the 10th degree. If there's somebody in the audience who knows better than I, please, please step in. But if I understand right, there's been a recent vote which boiled down to should we release water to the basin, basin's farmers? Or should we not, should we hold that water back and take a federal, federal, federal money? Uh, what are your thoughts on, how would you answer that question? Would you, would you go with the federal benefits or the release of the water? So I didn't get to participate in that vote. My wife and I have KBID contracts and Warren Act contracts. So I was really interested to see how that vote was going to turn out. And the vote was fairly unanimous that they wanted to uh, deliver water. The federal government has said that the irrigators are going to get 50,000 acre feet this year, but it's going to take roughly 400 and some thousand acre feet for everybody to actually get water. So what that means is Benji and I aren't going to get water again. It, it just makes, we're not going to get water. Um, so I, I, I probably am going to ride the fence, and here's where I'm going to ride the fence on that issue. There is a lot of farmers that just want to farm. They don't want federal assistance, and that was the vote. That's why it was overwhelmingly supportive of just release water. People want to farm. They want to save their properties. They want to raise their families on their farms. They're hardworking Americans that want to farm, so God bless them. And I'm with them on that. But there are other people that, like, like our little farm, the 50,000 acre feet isn't going to do anything. It's not going to offset our expenses. So government assistance is going to be very beneficial for people to, to fall in that situation. Benji and I had to make some really hard decisions when we haven't had water. And we've had to change our business model. And we have not taken federal assistance. That's why I'm saying I'm riding the fence. I'd love just to have the water. But I'm not going to take the federal assistance as well. So we have to adapt and modify our business plan to make it, make it work for us so we can stay in the black. To date, we haven't even had an operating loan. So we've scrimped and saved and done everything we could to make sure that we, we stayed successful. Um, so how would, I, how would I answer that? I see both sides of the argument. But as a Plymouth County Commissioner, I think it's important to recognize that if I was in a position where there was a vote, my opinion would be what the people wanted. I'd try to go back to the 1906 original contract that was established with the uh, um, River Project. Uh, that basically mandates that humans come first, irrigation second, fish, and industrial, and then if anything's left over, the state. Uh, those are the pretty, pretty basic guidelines that were set out way back then to help the farmer. And I don't know how many people know how high Lake Keno is, the, the dam, but it's 22 feet tall. The lake is approximately 49, almost 50 feet deep. That dam was built for the farmers. That water on the top part of that lake belongs to the farmers. It should remain the farmers. Now, we have the sucker fish, we have all these other people stating that we need to save this, we need to save that, we need to save the other thing. Well, if we don't save ourselves and keep producing food, well, what, what chance do we have of survival? I'm not saying that sucker fish aren't important, but we can have some happy medium. Uh, and the sucker fish have survived how many years? How many hundreds of years? Um, this is a small bump in the road, but that contract should be reinitiated re and brought up to modern times. And I think Siskiyou County, if I understand, helped initiate that contract. So working together with, uh, I think, a gentleman named Bill, which was the one that first came up with it and working jointly with Klamath County was able to establish a better contract under that. So I would try to focus going back to that to supply the needs of the farmers. Thank you. Mr. Fowler. So at the end of the day, I stand with the farmers, but at the same time, I will tell you, and somewhat like Dave said, I kind of ride the fence a little bit, but I will, my ranch doesn't have a lot of right. So, um, I have to defer to what, what the experts say, and, and the experts are the farmers. 
Um, at the end of the day, there's a percentage of them that have to make the decision whether or not to put food on the table. And if that means taking you know, the federal assistance for them, then hey, I support that. But the overwhelming majority have said they want the water. And I will stand firmly behind the farmers and fight to get the water. Well, I, I think that it's kind of an interesting question because as a, as a county commissioner, our job is to run the different, different 26 departments that are here. Um, our job is not water because water is actually an Oregon and a federal issue and you got the, you got the, the tribe as well um, with the Endangered Species Act, which is a federal act. Which, so I don't think we'd ever be put in that position, but at the same time, we would represent the people and we have to keep in mind, and it's a difficult thing because the people do include the tribes in this county. So as much as I want to say, yeah, I'll go farmers, you, we, need, we need to, as, as it's going to be important that as commissioners we keep the peace and we keep the communication open between what agencies are calling the shots because there's a lot of propaganda out here, even, you know, everybody gets on one side or the other. And, and at the end of the day, agreements have been made, adjudications have been made, and understanding that, and that's one of the things I've been doing and just reading through all the 65 agencies that play with water, I've been trying to find out who they are and who pulls the levers and when and how. So that's one of the things I've been doing being new here. Um, so again, that's kind of my perspective. We have to represent the people, but we have to remember that there's more than just farmers in the entire thing, and we also have to deal with the, the state and the working, but we have to remember the home count, home county rule. So I'll start ending with that. Okay. So, uh, on the same subject, and I agree with you, the, it's, I used to farm. Lord knows I'm, I wasn't a good farmer because I'm not a farmer anymore. <laughs> but uh, the, it's more than just the farmers. Take a drive downhill road down there. See Tule Lake. It's a, it's a desert. It's never been that way before. They've completely destroyed the Pacific Flyway. Or we take our grandkids down there every other weekend or something, see a few deer, that's it. All because of a sucker that has, like you said, has, has been there for hundreds of years. Hell, I used to see a pile, I don't mean to keep using foul language, I'm sorry. But I, I've seen them, when we go out there, they, they, they uh, trouble with them when they're running. I've seen sucker fish when I was a kid pile that high on the bank. So this, I'm not gonna call it a bull, but I, the, you know, this sacred thing, I think is a, a, I think it's a, I think it's, it's completely wrong uh, because they, for, for that, they have completely destroyed all the other wildlife down here for one thing. Then when, when they talk about letting the, the salmon and then they put the warm water down there and they wipe out the salmon, they don't even know what the heck they're doing. And yet we're, tr we're tr trusting our science to uh, save the sucker when everything else is taking a back seat to it, I agree with you 100%. Go back to 1906 or whatever it is there. Go yeah, ahead. Mr. Kessler. One of the things, you know, alfalfa, if you guys are alfalfa farmers, some of you are here, you know, it, if you don't water it for three years or so, it starts dying. I mean, you've got to reseed it or whatever. Maybe we can, maybe we can make alfalfa endangered because we have plants that are endangered. That's just a crazy idea. But coming back to that, um, right now, the other thing I've been looking at water is, you know, Klamath, Klamath County, or the city, and even the county has places where they've got to get rid of their effluent that comes out of all the sewer systems. And there's technology now to make that type A drinking water, which is cleaner than what comes out of the duck marshes. And we can take the, all the water from the sanitary stuff and, and clean it up and put it back in the canals. And that's post, that's down, down river. So, there's that, some things that we can talk about. That's what we do with our lagoon system. Yeah. <clears throat> O'Connor takes it, <clears throat> puts it back out on the alpha for uh, 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 just fodder. It can't go to human consumption or anything. But we do that the, the same way. But I also have it on a good authority from Fish and Wildlife. They put the water down in that one corner over there uh, for the, the sucker and everything. They're down there netting those sucker fish. So when all that comes out, they can say, well, we don't have any sucker fish there. Now we don't have to have any water down there. The last drop of water they're going for. And don't, and it's political. It's not this and that. It's completely political. They're wanting to just kill the farmer down here. They're wanting to get all this land back and they don't care. And they're doing a scorched earth policy to it. Well, thank you for that answer to five questions.
standard questions. With that, I think we'll turn it over to the audience to see if there's any questions from the audience. Uh, Jerry. I'm involved in voter integrity. Rita has done a very good job at research. And we've been in Bonanza, and we have found discrepancies. I'd like to know from each of you how you feel about voter integrity, where you stand. If you see we, we should go back to uh, one day uh, voter ID and those type of things, because it's really been an issue. She's been back and forth. She's talked to the uh, county clerk several times. She's talked to the county commissioners several times, and we've not come, we're at an impasse. Because they're both, both sets are elected officials, so they can't dictate to the other, but somehow we need to come to an understanding about this, because if we don't fix it, we're not gonna have an honest vote. So, wherever you wanna start, I don't care. Mr. Head, you wanna address the voter integrity, how you would ensure it as a county commissioner? Well, since uh, I've been chosen as an observer uh, for the first time in my life, I found it very interesting being walked through the, the process. And there were many, many questions in my mind about the integrity of the system. Um, we finally got some answers out of the county clerk. Not all of them, but uh, it's a start. Uh, is the system perfect? Absolutely not. Does it need a lot of work? Same criteria, it needs a lot of work. Uh, it's what we have to work with right now. Does it need to be changed? Yes, hopefully, uh, I don't think we can change it by the 17th of May, but hopefully by November, we'll, there will be other protocols put into place to stop any type of voter ID fraud. And as far as uh, filling out a ballot and going in and putting it in a drop box, just like we used to do when we were younger, mom and dad, so on and so forth. Uh, instead of reinventing the wheel just because it got a flat tire, don't make a new one. Just fix the system. That's all. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fowler. So generally speaking, I, don't, I think by and large, the system we have in Platinum County generally works. Now, are there people on the voter rolls that probably shouldn't be or aren't here anymore, or things of that nature? Yes, there's not any place you're gonna go in America where that's not the case. Um, should there be greater oversight of those activities in that system? Yeah, I would support that. Um, should we go back to paper ballots and, and in-person ballot, you know, in-person voting and, and voter ID and things like that? I don't think those are bad ideas. Um, for 200 and almost, almost 250 years, okay, our, our system of government used paper ballots and, and ID to get, you know, to vote. Um, it worked well for a great many years. I don't know why it wouldn't work to continue that. Great, Dad. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kessler. Yes, um, I also went through the voter uh, observer training um, at, the, at the county with, with Rochelle, and um, uh, we were asked if we had any, any suggestions to do, and my response was two things. Turn the live stream on 24-7. Don't turn it off. And uh, we've got some emails back and forth, and it will be turned off whenever there is not a human present. Um, and the, I ask, also ask that they update their county website to show and reflect that, which I haven't checked today, but it wasn't as of yesterday updated. It's just a very confusing schedule. Um, so I'd like to see that fixed. I'd also like to see a second camera put in place to watch the adjudication station. And I've made that request. And Rochelle responded and said, I'm not changing my policy, I'm elected, and this is the way we're going to do it. We don't have to do it. It's a courtesy we're, we're providing. Other counties don't do it. And so um, this is the way it is. And so I, I respect Rochelle, and I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to thank her for her great communication, and she didn't take my suggestions, and that's okay. Yeah, Mr. Hensley. I get irritated when I see our state, uh, Salem, <clears throat> try to make things easier. So we've seen, we've gone to mail-in voting, we've seen decriminalization of crime. Now hard drugs are not a crime anymore. So things seem to be changing to make our lives simpler when in essence they're making them more complicated and there's more fraud and more abilities to do things wrong in society. Um, so I, I'm, 
a huge fan of considering and looking at how do we go back to paper voting, how do you show your ID, mark your ballot, turn it in, because at the end of the day, voter integrity is out the window right now. Many, many people, thousands, millions of people are concerned about voter integrity. And when that many people bring up an issue, it's a requirement for us to look at it and try to make that system better. And sometimes we have to roll back things we've done that we thought were going to be a good idea that just flat aren't. Um, so I think that, uh, I, I too think Rochelle's doing a great job. I have not heard anything negative about her. But if community members are concerned about voter integrity, then that's our obligation to look into it to make sure that we make sure the system um, is accountable. And we're hearing a lot of people say it's not. So I would be interested in looking at how do we make that better in the future. Thank you. Well, we're pushing an hour, so I think we should try and wrap it up within that hour. It's time for one more question. Uh, is there another question from the audience? I have one. I have uh, first of all, I want to apologize. I didn't know about this. We were just in there practicing, and I, I don't think anybody else knew about it, or else we'd have a better crowd here. I guess when we were talking about uh, the growth and everything, I, and I don't know the particulars, but it was always, what's your, what are you, is your incentive to bring new business into the county? You know, you hear the story that Costco was going to come in at one time or another. And then I heard the story that, well, the county commissioners, blah, 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 I don't know what it was. Uh, I didn't pay that much attention to it. But what kind of incentives are you going to give? And that might be the wrong word. What are you going to What are you going to do to get new business? If it's a dying community, how are we going to bring in new business? I don't think you're wrong. Actually, the, it, it is a challenge. But at the same time, the, the county commissioners haven't killed Costco, okay, and haven't kept Costco from coming here. The reality is, is Costco has different metrics. Um, every corporation has different metrics for where they go and where they put stores and things like that. A lot of it is generated by economic uh, data that they get. They buy data from credit card companies, where people spend their money, things of that nature. Um, those are a lot of the driving factors behind that. That said, I, I support growth and I support you know diversifying our economy where it makes sense. Um, I, I really like to see 10 small businesses rather than one big business. Um, and because from an employment standpoint, I think that makes greater sense. Um, generally speaking, we don't have to give away a bunch of tax breaks um, for a big business to come in um, that promises jobs and you know the tax breaks last for two or three years and then the business leaves when the tax breaks run out and the jobs go away. Um, we've seen that happen a lot in Klamath County. So I, I'm open to it where it makes sense, but there's really got to be some measurement points and it's some things that you know, hold people accountable uh, before they get those special deals or those tax breaks. Okay, Mr. Kissel. A couple things on housing. Um, I've talked to some of the top builders in, in the U.S. to try to get them to come here. I made an LOI out on Ridge, Ridge Water when I first got here um, and have looked at some other de development and, and run the numbers. And one of the challenges is, is that we don't want to become, we don't want to make mistakes Ben did and become a big tourist destination out here because that's not what we're about. We're about farming. But at the same time, we don't have enough local builders to build the housing that we need. So we are going to, we want housing, and that is the jobs and housing and water. There's those three different pieces that have to go together. Um, we have to bring that together. The other fun thing we have is we have the city of Altmont, right in the middle of Klamath Falls, which is our unincorporated area. And, um, and that whole area, even though it's, it's not a city, but you say, hey Siri, how many people are here in Klamath Falls? And it says 2,100, uh, 21,000. And then there's 19 in, in the city of, of Almont. And so you add it together, you get 42, 41, from somewhere in there. So, but what that does for us is it does help us. The benefit is, is that we can all get FHA loans. Um, because we are, population size is small enough we can do that. So it does help on the affordable housing side of things for those people who are smart enough to go get an FHA loan on their house. Um, so there are some advantages to that, but at the same time, people outside looking in say there's not enough here for us to bring our big store in. I've tried Cheesecake Factory, Cracker Barrel, and some ammunition companies to talk to them and try to come bring them in here. And they're just looking at the data and going, well, maybe, maybe not. The other thing we got to do is, is teach our kids and educate our kids to do automotive and the important stuff 
teach them how to cook, but not how to cook meth. One of the problems is we can't we can't find enough kids to work in our restaurants, you know, that aren't that can pass drug tests. So I mean, there's some there's some challenges that we have here um, that we've got to start cleaning up. And I think I just don't like that they legalize this stuff, um, the hard drugs. So anyway, okay. thank you. So one of my top priorities is to enhance our economy and have some economic growth while at the same time protecting our local businesses. And that, that's really important to me. We need to try to advance our local businesses as well. But you got to take a step back for a second. There have been a lot of businesses that have looked at Klamath Falls and Klamath County and, and thought about and actually had some plans to develop here, but those fell through. So we need to ask ourselves, why did those fail? Why, did those, why were those projects not successful? And the two main reasons those projects are not successful is there's not enough housing and there's not enough workforce. So we need to take a step back and look at our infrastructure. I'm going to give you a silly example, but it's going to make complete sense. When I was a police officer for the city of Corvallis, Oregon State University got to be a pretty good football team. And they started winning. We brought in Mike Riley and he was very successful. So they increased the size of our stadium a couple of times but we did nothing to change the infrastructure. So we had 42,000 people attend a game and we had two lane roads. <laughs> and it, it just didn't work. And it said, it said in my mind that you've got to establish infrastructure to be able to grow. And if you fail to do that, you'll, 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 these projects will continue to fail. So we've got to look at our housing. Right now we're struggling with middle income housing. Some people say that we need more low income housing, but that's not a fact. We need more middle-income housing because people that can afford those houses aren't buying high-income houses, they're buying down to the lower-income houses and it's putting a huge compression on housing. So we've got to develop and there are multiple projects right now going under contract to build that mid-income housing. So I'm really happy about that. And then we need to continue to work with KCC, OIT, the high schools for workforce development. So if we've got labor here, We've got housing here. It's going to be very marketable for us to reach out to business. So when I hear people say, why don't businesses come here? That's an awesome question. We've got to focus on why businesses aren't coming here. Develop our infrastructure, and then they will come. People say, if you build it, they will come. That's a fact. We have to build our infrastructure. OK, uh, last uh, response and answer, Mr. Hitler. Um, I'm going to go back a little bit to Al Schweitzer when he was a commissioner. And I don't know if any of you remember when they tried to get Costco here. And that fell through. A lot of it was ODOT. ODOT didn't want to compromise uh, with the off-ramp and the overpass that was needed for Costco. And it kind of went by the wayside. And Costco said, no, the infrastructure isn't there yet as far as the people. We've come a long ways. We've grown. And they have more people to support the Costco over in Medford now. So, I would definitely look into reopening uh, negotiations with Costco to make that happen, if possible. And as him, Mr. Hensley was saying, yes, the housing, infrastructure, absolutely. I found out the other day that uh, there's a contractor that has several houses that uh, uh, all he needs is a water permit to put it through. So it seems like the infrastructure is fighting the infrastructure to make it grow. Don't know the particulars about it, but people need to get together and work together to make it happen. Um, I spoke to uh, Harriman's the other day, and he said just two days ago, I, I was thinking about um, the culinary school. And we, it folded at KCC about a year and a half to two years ago. Um, what a better way to bring in high-end um, clientele is to open an internship culinary school. Well, a lot of people kind of scarfed at it when it first came about years back, but thinking out of the box, who has an internship? Um, and he's open for it now where he wasn't before. Uh, there's reams that could be used for that. Uh, the infrastructure with the trade schools, um, talking with, uh, um, I think the gentleman's name is Mark, at the senior center. He said, what a great project. Um, an internship for the students taking those classes. They can come work on the building. Volunteers can oversee them, make sure it's being done accordingly as a general contractor. I would love to support something like that and give my time to oversee these students, to give them a trade, because once we're gone, 
people like myself, the trades and skills that we have will most likely be gone, just like farming will be gone when solar moves in. So to try to um, create an infrastructure that will support things, I'm all for. And I will say one thing in closing. How many have stood in the long pharmaceutical lines a few uh, months ago? Um, I learned from being here 12 years ago. We've lost five pharmacies. Um, at that point, we had lost those five. Uh, no fault of anybody's, but the uh, thanks to Governor Brown, she upped the tax um, on the products that we depend on to the pharmaceuticals. And then um, there were two different companies in charge of uh, the pharmacies here. And one supported the vaccine, one didn't. So employees that didn't want to get it weren't coming to work. So we had the extra tax that some of the people like Bymark couldn't afford, and we had COVID coming into play. So between the two, it devastated Klamath Falls. And I brought chairs into the store for the old folks to sit in because they couldn't stand for two hours at a time. It was very sad. I, I, I've never seen anything as devastating and sad as that. So. And it should have never happened. And we're still down two drugstores from what we had when I moved here 12 years ago. So things like this should be seen. Things put in the protocol and in a place where they won't happen. So thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to say it's great to see a four strong candidates vying for a commissioner position. I want to thank you very much for coming to the city of Merrill. Uh, we'll just dismiss and we can have informal discussions. And again, thank you very much for spending some of your time here.